Hi right, everyone, in this lesson we'll be talking about sex discrimination. Uh, this is such a big issue that we're actually going to be, there's three main topics that we'll talk about. There's general sex discrimination, then there's sexual harassment, then there's sexual orientation discrimination. And we'll talk about each of those topics in separate lessons here, first starting out with in general sex discrimination. So in general, what we're trying to do is avoid discrimination with regard to things like uh, advertising, applications, interviews, hours, job positions, discipline, training, seniority systems, pay, benefits, termination, terms and conditions of employment, all the things that are encompassed in the employment environment. We'll also say that uh, one of the topics that oftentimes comes up is what we call general favoritism. This is, you may have worked in an environment like this where you have a supervisor who is having some type of relationship with an employee and then promotes them of, over people who might be more qualified. Okay. This is not necessarily a violation of Title VII. It's not a very good policy. It might actually be a violation of established company policy, but in and of itself is not necessarily a violation of Title VII. So um, most companies, once they reach a certain size, will have some type of company policy saying that supervisors shouldn't have relationships with subordinate employees because it can lead to all these issues. Number one, you're promoting people who were less qualified. Two, it's going to create a very negative and toxic environment where people see this happening and all of a sudden they care much less about that supervisor or the company in general. So um, next, we'll just say that sex plus discrimination is covered under general sex discrimination here. That means when you say, well, I don't necessarily have a problem with hiring women, but I'm not going to hire a woman who is married or who is also pregnant or who is also old or unmarried with children, whatever it is, once that uh, sex element is there, then it's covered uh, under Title VII. So some sex related issues we'll talk about here. One is the first we'll talk about is stereotyping. So, you know, we're, we all have certain attitudes and expectations that we got from wherever, from our parents, from school, from society in general. And sometimes those attitudes can have negative effects on certain races, certain genders, whatever it might be. Um, so here talking about the societal stereotypes about how men and women specifically should act, uh, those can affect how employees are viewed in the workplace. So, um, women can oftentimes be criticized for acting too masculine. Sometimes men can be criticized for acting too feminine. Um, when you're changing the way you behave towards somebody and if they're suffering an adverse action because of some expectation about how masculine or feminine a person should be, then we're getting close to having trouble under Title VII here. So we've got to be careful about that. Um, sometimes people think men and women are better suited for different jobs, which this expectation can exclude people from certain opportunities. Uh, some people think women are too emotional to handle a high-stress work environment, which is going to get you in trouble. Um, some people think women don't need an income as much as a man. That was a very common attitude from, you know, decades ago when it was more commonly thought that the man would be the earner and the woman, if she does have a job, which she doesn't need one, would only have it as a hobby or just for extra money or whatever. Um but that attitude is not going to hold today and can get you in trouble. Uh, some people would be hesitant to hire women just because they thought, well, the woman is just going to get pregnant and then leave. Um, so you can see how that would adversely affect women trying to get a job. Um, and it may be that a person does get pregnant and maybe they return to the office. Maybe they don't, but we can't take action based on, uh, my projection of what I might think happen will happen in the future. Um, there is a case that I think I have it in one of our assignments where we have an aggressive woman who is viewed 
negatively in the work environment, while a similarly aggressive man would be viewed positively. And that all just ties back into these stereotypes that we that we have, and we might not even be aware of them as we're acting on them. So this is your call to at least be aware of them. Next topic is grooming codes. It's totally fine for employers to have dress codes and grooming codes, and you can have them for men and women. Uh, you have to use reasonable standards of appropriate attire. Appropriate would be context dependent, whatever the job is and whatever the environment is. Um, something that wouldn't be permitted. So a couple of examples of things that wouldn't be permitted is if I had a weight policy and I only applied it to women, but not to men. So you can see how that's an issue because I'm treating the sexes differently. Uh, or if I required women to wear a very specific uniform and allowed men to wear quote business attire, which would just be sort of general and kind of open. So you can see how that's unfair requiring having a very specific thing for women, having a very general thing for men. Um, so those are just examples of, of cases that have arisen and been dealt with by the courts. Um, so a question we can ask ourselves is, does the grooming policy subject males and females to different conditions in the workplace? Okay. If females wear scant clothing or if I'm requiring them to wear scant clothing and then they're subjected to catcalls and lewd comments while the men are not, then that would be a difference in the way that men and women are treated. Um, just saying that an applicant is aware of it when they got hired is not necessarily a defense for employers. If they say, well, you knew you were going to have to wear that when you get hired, so you can't complain later on about it. Um, that's usually not going to be a defense, a defense for most of the stuff covered under Title VII and no difference here. And some people wonder, well, in the case of a restaurant like Hooters or some other, there's a lot of other restaurants that have some of the same general model. I don't have great answers for you there. It just seems like um, Hooters got sued by a group of men once who were saying that they were not allowed to be wait staff because Hooters would only hire women to be wait staff. Men could work there, but they would be back in the kitchen. And they settled out of court and there was some kind of agreement reached between Hooters and the EOC and the DOJ where they just agreed that they weren't going to sue them anymore. Um, so that's kind of where we are uh, with that question. I still think it's technically sex discrimination, but everybody seems to be just leaving them alone. Although the company's not doing well right now. So I don't know, maybe that issue will resolve itself. Um, customer or employee preferences, not a defense under any of these um, protected classes under Title VII or any of the other laws we talk about in here. I can't just say, well, well, all my customers want to see a man doing this job or all my customers want to see a woman doing this job. Um, it's not going to be the kind of thing that will be a good defense for you in court later on. There are some logistical considerations that come with um, having men and women in the same workplace. Sometimes there are things we need to think about that, we, that might not be top of mind. So an employer is not allowed to discriminate because of logistical considerations unless it involves some unreasonable financial burden. This would be the undue burden kind of thing that we think about when we're uh, talking about accommodations. So one thing, the one issue that arose in one case was whether or not a female reporter would be allowed to go into a male locker room when they're acting as um, a press agent uh, at a sports event. So somebody from like CNN going into the locker room of, you know, an NFL football game or something like that, just to interview players. And you could see how if you banned female reporters from being in a male locker room, how that could be um, unfair to female reporters. They will lose out on these opportunities that males would have. Um, so now that's allowed. Um, there's certain etiquette, as I understand it, within the locker room where... We have to be careful about how we treat people. Um, there was another case that arose where there was a, a construction work site where men and women were required to use the same bathroom facilities. And the employer said, well, th these are basically porta potties where the employer said, well, 
you're using the same facilities, so everything's equal, so there's no discrimination happening here. But the women were complaining that the porta potties were so unsanitary that it was subjecting them to special health concerns that the men didn't have to worry about, uh, just due to the nature of different genitalia. And so it goes to a court, and the court said that, well, even though the employer was technically um, saying equal facilities for both, it's not that simple because women have special health concerns that might require an accommodation so that they're equally um, protected in the workplace. Um, so in that case, they had to provide a different bathroom for women to use that was more sanitary and didn't subject them to additional health concerns. Another big topic is the topic of breastfeeding. So a new mother um, having to pump to provide food for their child. Um, under the F uh, FLSA, excuse me, as, amend as amended by the PPACA, this is the Affordable Care Act, or some people call it Obamacare, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this requires employers to provide reasonable break time for as many times as are necessary uh, for one year after a child's birth. This requires the employer to provide a place, not just a bathroom, it has to be other than a bathroom, shielded from view, as would make sense, and free from intrusion from coworkers and the public. So all that sort of makes sense. It covers nearly all FLSA covered employees. Although there are some exceptions, certain employees of airlines, railroads, and motor coach carriers not covered, though they might have some coverage under state and local laws. It doesn't apply to employers with fewer than 50 employees if it would create an undue hardship. And that's a big if. I would have to demonstrate uh, to DOJ that I'm actually experiencing an undue hardship here. Undue hardship is determined by looking at the difficulty or expense of compliance for a specific employer in comparison to the size, financial resources, nature, and structure of the employer's business. So again, it's very context dependent. Uh, if an employer comes up and says, well, I can't just give them these breaks because it's going to cost me a lot of money. The last issue is here concerns compensation. So the employer has to provide this break time. It has to be a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable number of times per day. Um, so it would be common for a nursing mother to maybe have to take up to maybe even four breaks per day. And maybe those breaks are 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, just all kind of depends. So as long as it's not causing an undue hardship should be okay. Um, but then, like I said, the last issue here is compensation. So um, the employer doesn't necessarily have to compensate the employee for those breaks. However, if paid break time is already offered and the mother is using that paid break time, then they do have to pay for that time. If they decide that the break time is going to be unpaid, then the employee has to be completely relieved of all duties for that time. They can't say you're taking an unpaid break and then ask them to check email during that break or something like that. Um, so that's, that's where we are right now with uh, breastfeeding or breast pumping. Okay. Equal pay. Um, the equal pay act uh, was an amendment of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And the basic thrust of it is that um, employers subject to minimum wage provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act can't use gender to pay less on jobs, the performance of which requires equal skill, effort, and responsibility performed under, under similar conditions. So if a man and a woman are doing the exact same job or as close to it as we can get, then I shouldn't be paying them different amounts of money unless that difference is based on something else. We'll get to that in just a second. Part of that also, you know, when we're trying to get this legislation passed, a lot of men start to get afraid and say, well, if they're required to pay us both equally, all they're going to do is reduce the man's pay to be equal to that of a woman. So then they provided that little carve out there in the legislation saying you can't just reduce the pay of a man to make it equal with a woman, you would have to raise the pay of a woman to make it equal to the man. 
um, this is all based on the assumption that the woman is making more or the woman is making less than a man, which would be typical, though not every single time. Like I mentioned earlier before, a difference in pay is okay if it's based on something else, not just sex. So if it's based on seniority, okay, a merit system, some type of quantity or quality system, any factor other than gender, the difference would be okay. But I can't just base it on paying a woman less than a man. Comparable worth is this theoretical thing. So people look in society and say, well, there are certain jobs that seem to be predominantly male, some jobs that seem to be predominantly female. But if we look at the kinds of requirements, the kinds of qualifications, the kinds of education that a person would need to have, could we create this comparable worth? So if we said that, it, well, an electrician would have to have roughly the same amount of training as a nurse would, should an electrician be making the same as a nurse? That's the underlying idea behind this comparable worth theory. And I'm not aware of anywhere that's actually applying this and making it part of uh, some type of public policy. It's something that um, some academics are considering or have been considering for many years, but I don't see any place where it's actually been implemented. Maybe we'll hear more about it over time. I don't anticipate any time in the near future. Uh, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009 was an amendment uh, to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, stating that the 180-day statute of limitations resets with each new discriminatory paycheck. That was a reaction to a Supreme Court case called Ledbetter versus Goodyear Tire, which found that Lily Ledbetter, the woman here named in the case, had been getting paid less than uh, men for doing the same job for a number of years. And the Supreme Court said, well, this there exists this 180-day statute of limitations. So when a discriminatory event happens, you have that 180 days in order to bring your lawsuit. And they said that she could only be fairly compensated for the paychecks that she got during that the last 180 days, you know, prior to her filing the lawsuit. And so she got dramatically undercompensated for what she should have been. Uh, so then Congress acted and passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009, saying that that statute of limitation resets every time you get a new discriminatory paycheck, which would allow an employee to go back years and years if we found out they were being paid in a discriminatory fashion. So can gender act as a BFOQ? The Short answer is yes. The longer answer is yes, but it's going to be very narrowly interpreted because of the potential for it to be abused. The only thing that I'm really, really aware of currently would be something like a bathroom attendant where you require the a male bathroom attendant for a male bathroom and a female bathroom attendant for a female bathroom. Um, and that's if a company decides to do that. They don't have to. I've been to places that had a female bathroom attendant in like a bar or a nice restaurant or something like that. Uh, but if a company was to try to argue that as BFOQ, maybe, maybe not. Um, I can't think of any other really good examples, but there might exist some out there. Um, pregnancy discrimination. Okay. Another big topic under sex discrimination. Um, We'll talk about the, the older law, then the newer update. So the older law is the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978. So this amended the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, it prohibits from using pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions as a basis for treating an employee differently than any other employee with a short-term disability if that employee can perform the job. Okay. Um, so essentially just... I can't discriminate against a person who is pregnant or just had a child or is suffering some type of medical condition related to the pregnancy or childbirth. Um, I can't treat them any differently than any other person who might have a short-term disability. Okay. Um, there's a reaction to a Supreme Court decision in a case called General Electric Company versus Gilbert 
1976, which held that pregnancy discrimination was not sex discrimination under Title VII. All right, so we've seen here a couple of cases where we get this big Supreme Court case. There's this general uproar in society, and then this prompts Congress to pack some, uh, to pass some type of legislation to fix what happened during that case. Um, the newer law here uh, that was just passed in 2023 is the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, and I've linked you to some resources to learn much, much more. I'll try to give you the best summary that I can give you. But this requires employers to provide a reasonable accommodation to a qualified employees or applicants known limitations that are related to, affected by, or arising out of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. So prior to this year, when I taught this course, I, I taught that there was only two protected classes that needed an accommodation or the possibility of an accommodation. One was disability and the other one was religion. Now we have three because we've added pregnancy in there. Um, so now if a pregnant uh, worker or if somebody who just had a child notifies the employer that they need some type of accommodation in order to be able to do their job, now the employer has to attempt to try to find that accommodation unless the accommodation will cause the employer an undue hardship. Um, we've talked about undue hardship many times. The very short definition is significant dif difficulty or expense. Uh, that went into effect June 18th of 2024. I'm actually recording this in 2024, so it's very recent. Uh, this applies to public and private employers with 15 or more employees. It applies to Congress, federal agencies, employment agencies, and labor organizations. So very similar to the other protected classes um, under Title VII. So what's the process of requesting and trying to find this accommodation here? Well, the employer applicant has to notify the employer that they have some type of limitation. This will trigger the employer to engage in the interactive process with the employer applicant, discussing whatever limitation that might be and whatever adjustment might be needed at work. The employer should respond promptly to accommodation requests, providing a reasonable accommodation as long as it does not cause an undue hardship to the employer's business. Now, the accommodation can be possibly what the employee requests, or it doesn't have to be. It could be some other effective and reasonable accommodation if that's preferred by the employer. Keywords here being reasonable. Employers can require confirmation from an employee's healthcare provider under reasonable circumstances that are limited to confirmation of the condition and its relation to pregnancy, childbirth, or related conditions and a description of the adjustment needed at work due to limitation. So we're not trying to violate HIPAA here. We're not trying to invade somebody's privacy by getting all their health records, but just confirmation from a doctor that this condition exists. It's related to pregnancy or childbirth and um, some, at least some brief description of the kind of adjustment that might be needed at work. The last topic here, sorry, I'm having trouble forming my words today. The last topic in this lesson is uh, fetal protection policies. We haven't heard a whole lot about these lately. There were a few high profile court cases where an employer had a policy in place where a pregnant woman couldn't do certain types of jobs because it could possibly um, affect the health of the fetus or the reproductive capacity of employees. So when you, effectively, this would ban women or pregnant women from certain jobs. Now, it might be that women who might, women might want to avoid certain types of jobs or pregnant women might want to avoid certain types of jobs. Um, but the question is whether the employer can make that decision for the woman. And where we landed was not really, not really. Uh, they tend to exclude females from jobs that can pay more or have more promotional potential. So they're not, they are not encouraged um, where they apply only to women, but both genders are shown to be adversely affected by the conditions calling for the policy. They'll be considered a violation of Title VII. 
you would really have to prove and show that it will it wouldn't affect men it would only affect women or only affect pregnant women and i i understand the idea here as an employer i might be worried about the liability issues at play if uh, a pregnancy was terminated or if a baby was harmed uh, because of working conditions um, so I just have to be very, very careful with these um, so-called fetal protection policies. And it might be the opposite. That's the case. It might be that uh, a pregnant woman comes and says, hey, I don't want to do this job because it might be dangerous for me. And then we try to find an accommodation. But if we go the other way where the employer is saying outright, no, women can't do this or pregnant women can't do this, then they would have to have a really good justification and show that um, it's not just discriminatory toward women. Uh, so that wraps up this lesson. Hope you all have a great day.